Welcome, everyone. I want to thank all of you for coming to this lecture series, which was created in honor of my husband, Will Miller, a social justice activist and professor of philosophy who taught at UVM for 35 years. Beth Mintz, sociology professor, will talk about Will after my introduction to the lecture series. Then Ann Peterman will introduce tonight's speaker. I also want to thank the board of the lecture series for their work with me in helping to determine topics of interest for the lecture series and for their help in finding speakers who are current on the issues that Will would have wanted us to be discussing. The current members of our board are Ann Peterman, Helen Scott, Fred Magdoff, Mike Cassidy, Colin Robinson, and myself. Sorry, don't mind my music. <laughs> You're distracting them from me. <laughs> I also want to thank the co-sponsors to this event, Global Justice Ecology Project, the Burlington Chapter of the International Socialist Organization, Will Miller Green Mountain Vets for Peace, the English Department on UVM, at UVM, the James and Mary Brigham Buckham Fund, the Women in Gender Studies Program, and the Rubenstein School. We could not do this work without the generous support of people like yourself who have made donations to the lecture series. So we hope that you will assist us in keeping Will's legacy alive by making a contribution. Some containers will go around during the lecture series, during the lecture, I mean. We also have t-shirts with our logo on them and um, they're for sale for a donation of $10. You can also walk away with a t-shirt. Our, as our logo says for the lecture series, Will will always be remembered as a clear voice in a world of false words and disinformation. Our mission, which Will helped to construct, brings speakers to the UVM campus and the Burlington community to provide a continuing program of radical analysis of social, ecological, and political concerns. As many of you who knew him will remember, Will always wore message t-shirts. He used these messages to help start conversations with people and share his point of view about a variety of topics. He never saw the need for a blank t-shirt. I tried. <laughs> more than five years ago, at our memorial service for him, we hung more than 50 of the t-shirts he wore on a regular basis on a laundry line spread around the balcony of the Unitarian Church to help remind us of the many struggles he worked tirelessly to inform us about. If you look closely at our logo, you'll see specific symbols which represent a variety of issues Will spoke about and encouraged others to learn more about. Issues that were all connected with the theme of social justice. Well, except for the last one, which you can't really see. <laughs> it's not that we are all sheep. <laughs> um, I can find where I left off. Um, that symbol represented a personal passion of his, our small flock of sheep, who, by the way, were all given names of people he and I admired for their political work. Will was an amazing social justice activist. When Will spoke, we listened. This is why it is so hard not to have him around anymore. He helped us to understand topics that felt too big to understand. We were so incredibly lucky to have him in our lives for as long as we did. As we say in our mission statement, Will set a courageous example in speaking truth to power. He showed a boundless optimism and passion for the truth. His voice was powerful, especially in encouraging other voices to speak up and be heard. He had an unwavering commitment to the struggle against war. And, social and for social justice, and an amazing ability to move others into action. He was never afraid to speak his mind, put words into action, or place himself on the line, whether before the university trustees, on a picket line, at a barricade, or in a congressional office where arrest was eminent. He would be so incredibly proud of the faculty members and students who are continuing to speak out in the name of social justice, both on campus and off. Will offered reasoned and insightful analyses into the origins and workings of capitalism and imperialism, giving us both a call to struggle and a vision of a more just society, a society where all work is valued, where truth is not silenced but nurtured, 
where all are treated as equals, that is at peace with itself, and in which neither people nor resources are exploited. A year ago, I began a tradition of reading a favorite poem of ours at each of the lecture series events. This poem, poem was written by Howard Zinn, another extraordinary social justice activist and university professor who died this past year and is greatly missed. It offers us inspiration in trying times. On Getting Along in Difficult Times by Howard Zinn. You ask how I managed to stay involved and remain seemingly happy and adjusted to this awful world where the efforts of caring people pale in comparison to those who have power? It's easy. First, don't let those who have power intimidate you. No matter how much power they have, they cannot prevent you from living your life, speaking your mind, thinking independently, having relationships with people as you like. Read Emma Goldman's autobiography, Living My Life. Harassed, even imprisoned by authority, she insisted on living her life, speaking out however she felt. Second, find companions who have your values, your commitments, but who also have a sense of humor. That combination is necessary. Third, notice how precise is my advice that I can confidently number it, the way scientists number things. <laughs> Understand the major media will not tell you of all the acts of resistance taking place every day the strikes, protests, the individual acts of courage in the face of authority. Look, and you will certainly find it, for evidence of these unreported acts. And for the little you find, ex extrapolate from that and assume there must be a thousand times as much as what you've found. Fourth, note that throughout history, people have felt powerless before authority but that at certain times these powerless people, by organizing, acting, risking, persisting, have created enough power to change the world around them, even if only a little or briefly. Fifth, remember those who have power and who seem invulnerable are in fact quite vulnerable. Their power depends on the obedience of others. And when those others begin withholding that obedience, begin defying authority, that power at the top turns out to be very fragile. Generals become powerless when their soldiers refuse to fight. Industrialists become powerless when their workers leave their jobs or occupy the factories. Sixth, when we forget the fragility of power imposed from above, we become astounded when it crumbles in the face of rebellion. We have had many such surprises in our time, both in the United States and in other countries. Seventh, don't look for a moment of total triumph. See it as an ongoing struggle with victories and defeats, but consciousness of people growing over the long run. So you need patience, persistence, and you need to understand that even when you don't win, there is fun and fulfillment in the fact that you have been involved with other good people in something worthwhile. Okay, seven pieces of profound advice should be enough. Howard Zinn. Yeah. That was easy. <laughs> I didn't know it was so easy to turn that off. Um, so on that note, here's Beth Mintz, a close friend and colleague of Will's, um, on, who was a close colleague of Will's for at least 25 years at, at the University of Vermont. Thank you, Anne. I have comments. I have prepared comments. I'm going to read them, but I can't help but play off against <laughs> Anne. First, I can understand why that poem was a favorite of Ann and Will's. And indeed, for those of you who knew Will, I think you might agree with me when I say that he could have written that poem. It captured who he is much better than my remarks can. 
and much better than anything I say. Second thing that I take away from your talk is that you remind me, I don't know how many times every week and every month I think, you know what, Will could have given me insight into that. I'm so sorry that Will isn't here to help me think that through. And for that, what a loss. With that said, prepared comments. So Will, I welcome, I wanna welcome you. I wanna welcome you to the Will Miller Social Justice Lecture, Lecture Series, dedicated to Will Miller, longtime UVM philosophy professor and long, li lifelong political activist. Will taught at the University of Vermont from 1969 until he passed away in 2005. In those 36 years, he introduced generations of students to Marxist ideas and Marxist analysis. He served as a role model for progressive students, and this was reflected in his overflowing classes. Extremely generous with his time, he was quick to agree to serve as the advisor to a slew of progressive student organizations, and he worked closely with each of them. But to my mind at least, what distinguished Will from most of the rest of us is the way in which he learned from his students. He always reminded us that students would lead the way, and invariably, they really, really did. He would be at a shanty town on the green to protest apartheid in South Africa, or a student occupation of the president's office in reaction to racist policies. Will taught and encouraged his students to lead, and he proudly followed. Indeed, he may have well have been the only faculty member in the history of the university to have been arrested with his students and let out of Waterman in handcuffs. <laughs> For the faculty, however, Will didn't follow, he led. Most of you are probably aware that the University of Vermont, the faculty at the University of Vermont are unionized. What few of you probably know, though, is Will's role in this. In addition to doing the very hard work of grassroots organizing with a group that often didn't see itself as either grass or roots, uh, didn't know if that would work, uh, <laughs> Will did something almost single-handedly that allowed for the organizing effort. So what happened was, after a few failed attempts at organizing this campus, the National Labor Relations Board handed out a ruling that would be the death knell for many a faculty union. Faculty were ruled to be management, and therefore, I lost my place, and therefore, ineligible to unionize. Most of us were paralyzed by this, but not Will. He, realizing the difference between national and state labor law, marched himself down to Montpelier, where he lobbied our legislators and succeeded in having UVM declared an instrumentality of the state for the purpose of labor law. Now I'll spare you the details of what this means and how it happened, but the thing of import is, as state employees, we were no longer considered man management. And the rest, as they say, is history. Thank you, Will, for this. But as much as Will did for our campus, he did much more still for the larger community. As an anti-war activist, his veteran status lent legitimacy to an anti-war platform. His understanding of oppressions as interconnected forces him to stand up, for, uh, forced to, to interconnected forces led him to stand up on a slew of issues ranging from racism to sexism to environmental concerns. He understood the issues, he explained them to the rest of us in terms that we could understand, and he fought for social justice in all its forms. To get a feeling for the impact of Will's work, what I'd like to do is draw your attention to a website that's up and available to all of us honoring him. All you have to do is a Google search, do Will Miller Vermont, and you'll find pages and pages of testimonials about Will, about what he accomplished, and about what he meant to us. Read them, you'll laugh, you could well cry, and you'll get a good sense of the many ways that Will Miller made this place a better place to be. He is sorely missed. Thank you. And, and, and. <laughs> I 
And it's my pleasure to introduce our uh, featured speaker tonight, Jihan um, Giran, who is the Native Energy Organizer for the Indigenous Environmental Network. I'm Ann Peterman. I'm the Executive Director of Global Justice Ecology Project, and we have a partnership with the Indigenous Environmental Network. We work uh, together a lot on media, especially, trying to get out the voices of the communities that um, IEN works with, the people that they are um, responsible to, to get their voices in the media, because these are the voices, especially around the climate issue, that we need to be hearing from the impacted communities. Uh, and Jahan herself comes from one of these impacted communities from the Navajo territories in Arizona that are heavily impacted by coal, uranium, oil, and natural gas. Um, all of the energy industries are very much present there. And she's on the coordinating committee of the Grassroots Global Justice Alliance and the steering committee of the Environmental Justice and Climate Change Initiative. And she's been going to the UN Framework Conventions on Climate Change, the big uh, annual UN conventions since 2005, and uh, she was also a delegate at the Indigenous Peoples Global Summit on Climate Change, which was an historic occasion that happened a year ago in April. Um, and IEN has really held the line when it comes to a lot of work to stop the privatization of indigenous lands all over the world, which is being done under various auspices, but especially under the climate change um, issue under the what's called reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation program of the UN, which is meant to supposedly protect forests and stop them from emitting carbon when they're cut down, but is in fact being used as a massive land grab. And IEN has been doing incredible organizing work to stop that from happening. And uh, I'll let Jahan talk mo about more about that in her talk, but I just wanted to mention that IEN, Indigenous Environmental Network, is one of my favorite organizations because of the amazing work that they do. And Jahan is a really wonderful speaker, so I was really pleased that the lecture series was able to bring her here tonight. And uh, with that, I will let her have have some speaking time, and uh, and uh, we've enjoyed your music choices too. <laughs> and we'll have questions. Sorry. We'll have questions afterward, and I also wanted to mention that we have some homemade hot chocolate, really homemade from the cocoa bean itself, that um, some people are using to raise money to get to Cancun, where the next climate convention is happening, so that they can help us organize and support IEN and the other groups that are down there. So before you leave tonight, make sure you get a, a cup of homemade hot chocolate that will benefit Cancun organizing. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Sorry about the, the, mu the music, but... <laughs> You got to see a snapshot of the kind of music that I listen to. Um, I usually don't do um, PowerPoints, but uh, I thought maybe you guys would appreciate seeing some pictures from the different places that we work in, so I hastily put this together. That doesn't mean I'm not able to talk for a very long time, so. <laughs> Thank you for laughing at that joke. <laughs> so, um, I'll start uh, by introducing myself. Um, in my own language, yat e she jahan giran yenishya tulich idni nishle don na kaisle jene bashishchin tlash de ishe dasha che don na kaisle jene dasha nale. So that always makes me feel better because I get nervous when I first get up here, and so it makes you feel good to be able to makes you feel stronger to be able to talk to your talk in your own language. Um, so what I said was, <laughs> hello everybody, my name is Jahan Giran, and um, I come from Fort Defiance, Arizona, which is on the eastern side of the Navajo Reservation. Um, I'm Navajo on my mom's side and African American on my dad's side, and uh, I relayed for you my different clans. Us Navajos have uh, four different clans, um, so that's how we introduce ourselves, and you figure out how you're related to other people. Um, so. I'd also like to say thank you uh, to, um, for inviting me here and allowing me to be part of this um, Will Miller lecture series. He sounds like a really great man, so thanks very much for having me to be part of this. Um, and uh, thank you to all the sponsoring organizations, and thanks all of you for coming tonight and listening to me. I hope that I say something interesting. Um, <clears throat> All right, so I work for the Indigenous Environmental Network, or IEN, and um, 
IEN is a network of indigenous peoples empowering indigenous nations and communities towards sustainable livelihoods, demanding environmental justice, and maintaining the sacred fire of our traditions. Um, so we are a network based out of the US and Canada, um, mainly, but we work with people, indigenous peoples and allies around the world um, to strengthen our indigenous people, basically, so that we can get out of the very negative environments and situations that we're in right now. Um, I run our Native Energy and Climate Program, and so the goal of this Energy and Climate Program is basically just to build the capacity of indigenous peoples to be able to stand up for themselves, uh, fight for themselves, and make correct decisions for themselves, for ourselves. Um, and we do that through a lot of different ways, um, through education, like we hold these things called action camps where we give people skills um, in how to organize. Uh, we work with allies on all kinds of campaigns, direct action work. Uh, media work. Um, we also work a lot with uh, non-native allies. You know, a lot of people say, "Well, indigenous people are like less than one percent of the population." Like, well, who care? Or not who cares? But it's like, why should we care about the issues <laughs> that uh, you're working on, or care about that small, minuscule population? And um, so, I think a lot of our work is also. Uh, getting people to understand why that's important. Um, we also play the role of just connecting. We're all connectors um, of indigenous communities uh, who are working on the same kind of, who are working against the same coal mining company, for example, or with other larger campaigns um, and non-indigenous allies. We play that role of connecting people. And then we also play the role of watchdogging policy. So, you know, we on the national and international level especially, it's our job to keep an eye on what policies are being developed and to be able to communicate that to our grassroots communities so that they understand what's happening and how these things might affect them. Um, we also have within the energy and climate program specific campaigns. Um, one of them is the Canadian Indigenous Tar Sands campaign um, that's run by our staff person Clayton Thomas Mueller out of Ottawa. Canada. We have the, which, um, does everybody know what the tar sands are? Okay, good. No. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I will show you pictures of it later. Um, but the tar sands is a giant, it's the biggest industrial project in the world ever that's happening in Alberta, Canada, um, to develop this thing called tar sands, which is basically sand mixed with oil um, <clears throat> that uh, creates, as you can imagine, through the whole process of creating oil that can be used, lots of different pollutants more than conventional oil development. Um, we also have the Tribal Campus Climate Challenge campaign, which is run by our staff person, Candy Mossett, out of Bismarck, North Dakota. And that is about working with youth and tribal colleges so that, um, so first that, that these young people have a good understanding as they grow older and move into leadership positions within the tribe or tribal government that they understand these kind of environmental issues and what sustainability truly is. And the second part of that is to create kind of models of sustain sustainability on reservations using the tribal college campus because a challenge that we come up with a lot in indigenous communities who are affected by different uh, energy develop developments or any community who's, you know, um, fighting for basic survival is that a lot of times people can't see any kind of positive outcome or they just accept that this is the way that it is. So the goal of this program is also to create places where we can do community gardens, where there's language revitalization, small scale solar and wind installations, so that our tribal members can see for themselves, you know, that there's other ways of doing things. We have a food sovereignty campaign that just started this past year, run by Simone Senegals out of our uh, main office in Bemidji, Minnesota in northern Minnesota, which, as you can imagine, is about bringing the community getter, together to relearn how to harvest and sustain themselves off of traditional food, like wild rice, maple syrup, and that kind of stuff up in the Great Lakes. Um, and we've had other uh, campaigns in the years. Mining is something that uh, we've really been 
was always a large campaign, um, but we lost the capacity to continue that. But mining projects are popping up all over Indian country in the US and Canada and especially Alaska. So we've really been asked to start uh, working on mining projects again. Um, and so in 2011, we will relaunch that campaign and we'll also relaunch our campaign on toxics um, work. Okay, so I wanted to start with um, giving you a better understanding of where I'm coming from. Um, so that is the Navajo Nation there, situated in the Southwest uh, United States. Um, it's about 26,000 square miles. It's the largest reservation. It's the size of West Virginia, about. Um, and we also have the largest tribe. We have 300,000 members, some that live off the reservation and some that live on the reservation. Um, I wanted to, that last t-shirt <laughs> with the sheep on it, I was thinking that must be meant for me because <laughs> our Navajo culture has a lot to do with sheep. Um, you know, we make the Navajo blankets, the wool, it's a big part of our culture as we're like um, farmers and ranchers. So that kind of called out to me that maybe I was supposed to be here. <laughs> um, yeah, so here's a snapshot of that, the, our big reservation. I'm from Fort Defiance Agency. Uh, I grew up around the capital of our tribal government in Windorock, Arizona. Um, but to give you some more statistics about this area, um, there's about 32% of uh, Navajo Nation does not have running water. 38% um, do not have electricity. Um, and then the statistic is that 75% of all unelectrified homes in the whole United States is on our reservation. And <coughs> 56% of people uh, live below the poverty level. Unemployment is 50, it's like always hovers in between 50, 46 and 54%. Um, and this is like before any economic crisis. This is just how it's, it is. And the average income of a, a Navajo person living on the reservation is $7,000 a year. And <clears throat> so this is just kind of like to give you an understanding of where it is that we're coming from and the kind of communities that we're coming from. Um, you know, I'm not trying to say also, that, I mean, it is a bad thing, but if you ask an Navajo person, they're not gonna say, they're like, we're not poor and we're not impoverished. We take care of ourselves. A lot of people still subsist off of farming and ranching. Um, so we really consider ourselves very strong people. Um, but in comparison to the rest of the United States, using these, you know, uh, criteria, um, we're not doing so good. Um, another important thing to know about the Navajo Nation is that it is also a battery for the Southwest United States. So this is <coughs> in Aneth, this is in the Utah portion of um, our reservation. We've had a lot of oil and gas development in the northern part of our reservation. Um, this is, that's a sign. These are uh, they're called hoguns. These houses is a traditional houses. So that's a gas flare, not electricity pole standing there. Um, that the people in Aneth they have had a long history of oil development, and so therefore a lot of the people in there have a lot of problems, you know, health problems, and as well as a main issue there is that the water is very contaminated. This is in this kind of the center of our Navajo Nation is. Uh, Maybe a lot of, maybe some of you have heard about the Black Mesa Mine and the Canta Mine uh, on the Navajo and Hopi Reservations. The Hopi Reservation is right in the middle of the Navajo Reservation. And so the, there's two mines operating in this area called Black Mesa. So traditionally, um, our Navajo territory is in between four mountains uh, that are in Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona. And within the, this traditional territory, there's two kind of like mountain chains that go, that go like this. And the Black Mesa Mine is one of them, and the other one is the Cheska Mountains. In a traditional sense, they, the, the four sacred mountains of our territories represents the home, the Hogan that I showed you. And so each of those things, there's teachings associated with that. And those two mountains represent the man and the woman and the husband and wife inside that home. And so the Black Mesa Mine is, the fem is a female mountain um, for our people. And 
it is just, it has been torn up to get coal. Um, they say that the coal is the, fem is the female's liver, um, the female mountain's liver. And that makes sense because if you look in your Brita water filter, it's a piece of coal in there that's filtering out your water. And <clears throat> I like to tell that just because, you know, these things that sound kind of, uh, uh, kind of like fairy tales or the traditional teachings actually really make sense in a lot of practical terms. Um, so this is the Cantamine. Let me see another picture. That's one of the, that shows the Cantamine. These are two youth that we've worked with for a long time who are, are founding members of an organization called Black Mesa Water Coalition. And Black Mesa Water Coalition, along with uh, help with a lot of um, different ally organizations, were able to sit, shut down the mine, the Black Mesa mine, um, in, I want to say, 2005, I believe. There is, a, it is again, it's the largest strip mine operation um, in the country. Uh, and so the, a main issue in the Black Mesa area, again, is um, the water, because we live in a desert. And in this area of the reservation, there's, uh, the water comes from an underground aquifer called the N Aquifer. So Peabody Coal Company was using, pumping out the water to mix with coal to pipe it 273 miles in a slurry pipeline to Laughlin, Nevada, and to a power station called the Mojave Generating Station that provided energy for Phoenix and Los Angeles. and um, Las Vegas. Um, but we were able to shut that down because the community organized around protecting the water of the Navajo Aquifer. The pipeline was shut down. <clears throat> but there's still another mine right next to it called the Cayenta Mine that's still in operation and sends uh, its coal by train to Page, Arizona, which is also on the reservation. This is in the New Mexico side. Um, this is a Desert Rock Energy Project was another coal-fired power plant. It was like the third in that very small region that was being proposed um, by a company called Scythe Global, but also our own tribal government was a um, majority owner in that. So this brought up some really interesting issues um, of the community people being against our own tribal government. And that woman there in the blue jacket is Eloise Brown. She just, she lives near that area and she saw that they were coming in and doing surveying and she just parked her truck in front of the road and wouldn't move. And those grandmas came out with her and they barricaded that area. So this is another picture of them there. And those are our own Navajo Nation police um, who are trying to get rid of them. And that's just right next to her house. I took that picture. So there's coal mining there as well. So it, what you should notice, though, is we have, I also, what I didn't have a picture of, unfortunately, is we've had a long history of uranium mining on our reservation as well, since back in the 50s. Uh, uranium mining has been banned um, by our president in the past few years, for which we're very thankful. but. Um, there are still areas that you go to where the old uranium tailings are just covered by like a foot of dirt and that's supposed to be clean up. Have you guys ever seen like pictures of Monument Valley and like car commercials, those really red rocks? What they don't tell you is that area is totally contaminated by uranium. <laughs> and it's beautiful and pretty, but the people who live out there, they said um, the ground used to glow at night because it was contaminated so much. So what you should have noticed is we're giving coal, we're giving water, we're giving our health, we're giving the air quality, we're giving um, all of these things, and yet 38% of people don't have electricity. People are still living without electricity and have those electrical lines going straight over their heads. Um, so this is a definitely an injustice that has been put on our people for a very long time. And unfortunately, this is the case for indigenous peoples all over the place, um, in all over the US and all over Canada. So this is a picture of the development of the tar sands. Like I said, I wanted to put more in here. I didn't have the time. But um, the area that they are trying to develop in Alberta is the size of the state of Florida. 
<laughs> and it come, what comes with it is a massive infrastructure, which includes uranium mining, 11 nuclear power plants to power the tar sands project themselves. So that includes natural gas coming down from Alaska to power the tar sands, nuclear plants to power the tar sands, um, and then pipelines. Pipelines, expansions of ports coming all the way down like uh, British Columbia, what's that city? Vancouver, the Bay Area, LA, you'll see that a lot of the communities who live in those areas um, are fighting a lot of port expansions and that has to do a lot with what's coming down from the tar sands. There's also pipelines coming down through the northern plains down to the Gulf Coast from the Great Lakes over to the East Coast. Um, so what comes with the tar sands also is a massive, massive infrastructure. Um, and that's just some of the development that like we saw from the plane. This is, so it used to be this, which is just like cutting down pristine boreal forest, digging out so much topsoil, digging out the tar sands themselves, taking it out, processing it. And I've stood next to these trucks. The trucks are like three stories tall, how gigantic they are. They're gigantic. and. Oh. I wish I had put some more of those pictures in there, but it was just too many to sift through. Um, but these things are gigantic. Um, now they're moving into this thing called in situ mining, which you can see uh, here, which doesn't look so bad, but it completely, but it just doesn't look so bad. Um, so what they do instead is to try and push solvent, which who knows what the solvent is, um, push it underground, um, and then it loosens up the oil, and then they're able to pump it back out. So you can see that everything's happening below the surface, um, but you can imagine what's happening to the water or even you know the underground of what's happening under there. This is in Fort Berthold, um, which is where my coworker Candy is from. They've recently discovered, or rather it became very profitable to develop this thing called the Bakken Formation in North Dakota. And it's a oil deposit, a giant oil deposit. And so just within the past year, there have been gas, um, oil rigs popping up all over the place, just like do, 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 do. individual families are getting paid to put oil rig on their area, you know, they get however many thousands of dollars, um, but it's totally unregulated. The reason we first started working with this community was because there was a proposed refinery to be built in North Dakota that would refine oil that was coming from the tar sands as well. This is Alaska. We um, host a network called Red Oil, Resisting Environmental Destruction on Indigenous Lands in Alaska. And I really do believe that Alaska is one of the gra like ground zero for you know, environmental injustices in the United States. Um, offshore oil, um, well, I would say one of the good things that came out of the Gulf oil spill, even though I'm hesitant to say that, was that people had to take a second look at our offshore oil drilling, and it stalled a lot of the projects that were going um, a lot off the coast of Alaska, which is something that we're very thankful for. But Alaska is a tough state. It's an oil state. I mean, <laughs> look at Sarah Palin. And it's not, <laughs> it's definitely a hard place to fight. Um, these kind of uh, against energy development. This is in Ponca, Oklahoma. Oklahoma was the beginning of oil development anywhere uh, on the Ponca Reservation in Oklahoma. And so they've had a very long history of oil development and contamination in, um, in, uh, in their community. I took, I think this picture is interesting because you can see that oil refineries and stuff in the back there. And then this is what they gave them, a park with this statue of one of their chiefs from a long time ago. And I just think that picture is so ironic and wrong. But <laughs> that's an example. This is another good one. Um, if you can see that sign, uh, they have this in the stores there. It says, absolutely no carbon black shoes. So one of the things that they're really fighting against in um, Ponca is through the whole process of creating oil, all the crap that's left, that black crud, um, they sent it to a place called Carbon Black. And Carbon Black processes it and turns it into tires or whatever. Um, but you see these signs all over Ponkahoma that says, Ponka, that say absolutely no Carbon Black shoes because there's such a, everything is covered by black crap. Like the trees are black, the ground is black. And so 
they don't want you walking in because you have it on your shoes. And it's so hard to clean up that they don't want people walking in the stores with their shoes. It's very, it's really awful. And another problem with this area is that the water table is so high. It's something like only seven feet below a surface. And we actually have a video of um, a man that we work with named Dwayne Camp uh, taking water out, out of a dug hole and starting his lawnmower with it because it's so contaminated with oil. <laughs> yeah. So those are some snapshots <laughs> of the different places that we work um, throughout the U.S. and Canada. Um, and I wanted you to see those pictures and kind of hear that background because I want you to understand where it is that we're coming from when we move into the national or international arena and we're talking energy and climate policy. Like, this is what we're talking about. It's not just about parts per million or 20% reductions by blah, blah, blah. You know, it's about much more than that. For us, it's about um, environmental and economic justice. It's about the sovereignty of us to be able to make real decisions and have real choices in our homelands about human rights, cultural protection and revitalization, about decolonization, resiliency of our communities and our way of life and the sacredness of Mother Earth. So when we're talking about climate change or energy policy, that is where we're coming from. And that's the number one thing I wanted you to get. Um, because that's not the, the discussion that's being had out there by a lot of the people who are creating our energy and climate policies. They're not talking about things like this. And they're not talking about um, stopping the problem at the very source of the problem, which is fossil fuel extraction. But before I get into that, um, <laughs> before I get fired up on that, um, oh, I just realized it's kind of off, huh? Just very briefly, indigenous peoples are disproportionately affected by climate change in three main ways. The first that you just saw was the causes of climate change. And for us in North America, it used to be deforestation. You know, the f actually the first form of, you know, forest development on my reservation was deforestation. The community I'm from is called Old Sawmill because that was a sawmill um, that uh, processed the wood from the Cheska Mountains, which is the male mountain that I talked about earlier. Um, so, but mainly what I'm talking about here for us is uh, fossil fuel development, the burning of fossil fuels, the extraction of fossil fuels, um, what to do with the waste from fossil fuels. We're disproportionately affected that by that, as you can see. Um, we're also disproportionately affected by climate change itself, and it's very easy to see that in places like Alaska, where there are actual communities who are now having to relocate um, their whole villages that they've lived for a very long time because the ice is melting, because the coast is eroding because of climate change. Um, it's really easy to see in places like the Pacific Islands or like uh, countries like Tuvalu who know that they also are going to have to relocate, that the actual um, target for emission reductions that the UN has given us now isn't good enough, that they are definitely going to go underwater because of that. And so it brings up the questions, especially for indigenous people, if your whole language and culture is based off of a place, like how I told you, our home and our mother and our father, then what if you have to move away? Then what happens to that, you know? Uh, what happens to your culture? I mean, it's not to say that it's definitely going to disappear, but it's a really important question. And that's how, for indigenous peoples, climate change is affecting us right now. It's not something that we see in the distant future, it's something that we really see and understand now. The third way that we are affected by climate change is through many of the false solutions that are being proposed to solve climate change. So throw out some of them. What are you being told? will solve climate change here in the US. Clean coal. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Anybody ever heard of clean coal? No. Um, no. <laughs> no such thing. I mean, in our community, it doesn't make any, I mean, it has nothing. First of all, it doesn't even address the issue of where the fossil fuel is being extracted. Um, it's all about, you know, 
looking at that little tailpipe and how much is coming out of the smokestack, I should say. Um, and actually, this brings up another thing is that our community, Hopi Reservation and Navajo Reservation, have both been targeted within the past year to do pilot projects for carbon sequestration. And <clears throat> uh, the Hopi tribe, tribal government actually uh, accepted it. Um, this was like a couple of months ago. My boss emailed me and he's like, what the hell? You need to go out there and like talk to them about <laughs> what this is. And so people went out there to do a lot of edu- you do You want to know what carbon sequestration is? No, it's, it's <laughs> it was geologic sort of carbon sequestration, like putting it underground in some sort of open, aqu- or with our, our water aquifers, I think. But the Hopi tribe, I'm proud to say, after um, some education from not me, but a lot of the different community organizations that I work with there have rejected uh, doing a pilot project. And that was just very recently. That was just last month. But that's one way we're being targeted. OK, clean coal. Anything else? Oh, you're jumping ahead. <laughs> yes, carbon trading. I was thinking maybe we'd go to nuclear power. Um, <laughs> Safe, rea- safe reactors. You know, we also work with the communities. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, as you can see, for communities like us, where we've had a history of uranium mining that has nothing to do with how to address uranium, uh, the extraction of uranium, and it has nothing to do with how you get rid of the waste from the nuclear power. And there has never been, the last time I was here, a woman corrected me, so I have this fact right. I have never, uh, there has never been a proposal for a permanent storage for nuclear waste that is not on an Indian reservation. So you can expect where, you can assume where that's going to go. <laughs> I'm not going to touch that one. <laughs> These are some of the other ones. Clean coal, nuclear power, biofuels, Anne and Oren can give you a lot of information on biofuels. Geoengineering. So geoengineering includes things like putting up little solar reflectors in the sky that will supposedly block out the sun. Did anyone see the Simpsons movie? <laughs> Do you, wasn't it in the Simpsons movie when Monty Burns tried to block out the sun from Springfield with a giant? I mean, that's what they're trying to do. It was like a cartoon joke. And it's actually something that they're proposing now. Um, why I put renewables question mark? Um, we all know that renewables are great, but I always ask the question of, you know, equity, ownership, scale, you know, we always say that the Southwest, and it does, have so, has so much potential for solar power. But do we want giant solar farms on our Navajo reservation while our people still don't have electricity so that the people in Las Vegas and Phoenix can use energy in the middle of the desert where that city shouldn't even be in the first place, you know? So those are kind of the questions. I have a friend named John Shimmick, actually, who is from White Earth Reservation in Minnesota, uh, who did put up a wind turbine um, on their reservation. And he was all proud. And I'm like, yay, that's so cool. Um, this is just funny. This doesn't really have anything to do with what I'm about to say. But one problem that he had is that people kept trying to shoot at it. <laughs> That's just a funny Indian thing. But the, <laughs> but the second part of that is I was like, that's cool. You know, how many buildings do you power with that on the res? You know? And he's like, oh, well, we're only allowed to use it for one building. And the rest of it we have to sell back into the grid because we got it from a federal grant. So it's like those kind of questions about renewable energy. I mean, that's what I have questions about is what I'm saying. And then the last fall solution is the carbon market. Um, which involves carbon trading and carbon offsets at, it, at its kind of like basic level. Does anyone need that to be explained a little bit? OK. All right. I was going to make a fancy slide with graphics, and, but I didn't get to do it. So here's the globe. There's the globe, OK? <laughs> and uh, imagine that, OK, so there's the globe. There's the atmosphere. We know that climate change is caused by carbon dioxide going up into the atmosphere, OK? Um, so what is the first goal of our policy is to limit the amount of carbon dioxide. So we'll put a cap on it that's going out into the atmosphere. And this is globally. Now let's divide all that up 
like this little section of carbon dioxide that's allowed to be emitted will give that or sell it whatever to um, I don't know Shell Oil Company or ConocoPhillips or the US government and so now they have a permit they say I'm allowed to emit this much carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that's generally the carbon market carbon trading is about well the US you know we don't want to reduce our emissions so let's buy some of those other permits from the global south somewhere and so now we have more so now we're able to emit more that's the trading part of it and then the offsets part of it is um, so is that clear okay so the offsets part of it is um, well if we plant a tree over here then that balances it all out that's kind of like what an offset is um, in a, why are you laughing because it doesn't make sense but <laughs> I mean okay so let's that's generally what the two parts of the carbon market are um, this is something that I really need to pull in and want you guys to understand is REDS, which stands for Reducing Emissions from Deforestation and Forest Degradation. This is going to be a really key issue in Cancun. Um, so this is what I just said. This is a forest offset. So it's money, it's funding to uh, protect forests. Uh, in the Amazon and other places in the world. But what they don't tell you is what can a forest be? A forest doesn't have to be a natural forest. It doesn't have to be the Amazon. It could be uh, monoculture crop plantations of palm oil or pine trees or eucalyptus or GMO trees, genetically modified trees that supposedly take up carbon dioxide faster. Um, so what's happening and what could be happening more as this project or this uh, campaign around REDS is being pushed by a lot of people, uh, definitely by the main, not the main, but a lot of the people in the UN system working on climate change, um, is that, first of all, this uh, means, you know, U.S., all us industrialized countries just keep doing whatever we want. Business as usual. You, there is no problem with you, you know, being 4% of the world's population and creating over 25% of its emissions. You just keep doing that thing and it's okay. First of all, it says that that's okay. Secondly, um, that means for my community who's fighting all of these different fossil fuels or the tar sands, and the tar sands has, Canada has specifically said that it's gonna offset its tar sands emissions, which create three to four times as much carbon dioxide emissions as conventional oil by doing forest offsets. So that means that our communities who we're working with in the US Canada, um, this only like makes things harder for them um, because people think it's okay. You know, it makes it harder for us to stop a lot of these things that we're trying to stop. Um, it also puts a price to carbon, puts a price to air which, you know, if you've seen from the first slide about IEN, that part of us is also about maintaining our tradition. It's called the sacred fire of our traditions. So that means having understanding and utilizing our spiritual and traditional base and understanding, which to us means that it's wrong. Well, first of all, it's wrong to commodify land. It's wrong to commodify water. And now it's really wrong to commodify air, which is what they're trying to do, you know. Um, President Evo Morales put out a really good letter against REDS recently, a couple of weeks ago, and he said, so now the only value of a tree is how much carbon dioxide it's able to take in. What's, what about the value of seeing a beautiful tree or laying in the shade or being part of a whole ecosystem? Like this negates all of that, this pr campaign. And then when you go into the communities where things are actually happening, um, Indigenous peoples and forest dwelling, forest dwelling peoples in South America, they're being pushed out. This is a big land grab. So if now, uh, I just say Shell Oil Company because it's easy. Shell Oil Company <laughs> uh, now owns the property rights to the carbon in a forest and they don't want that to be disturbed, they're gonna kick anybody out who uses that forest. They're gonna kick out anybody who lives in that forest, 
who hunts, who grows, who collects medicines in those forests, and that's what's happening. And so it becomes a big immigration issue as well. So when we talk about, when we say reds, this is what we say. Change. This is what we say. Reaping profits from evictions, land grabs, deforestation, and destruction of biodiversity. And there's some booklets back there, uh, reds about reds, um, that you guys should pick up, some information back there. But this is really being, I wanted to show a little video here. I don't know how much time that I have. But um, this, I think, is very good because uh, what you'll hear is that, you know, red sounds great, it sounds wonderful, indigenous communities are being paid for these type of things, but um, that's not true. And this is, uh, it's nine minutes, but I think it's, I've been trying to show it to as many people as possible. This is um, uh, an interview with somebody, uh, an indigenous leader from Brazil, um, and he's talking about when they came to bring him this uh, Red project. Então, so, depois, outro, outro, well, outra informação para it's nós. in Portuguese anyway. So, sobre, <laughs> eu lembro, o nome é gar, Is this carbono, tal de carbono, né? Chama-se que, que nós não sabe isso aí, não entende isso aí, que que é carbono. Então ele vem explicar para nós, it? inclusive até veio okay. o chefão dele. So they explained to us all this, even their big boss came, Marcio. He came to explain this to us at another post. He explained brief and quick. It will be this and that, and there will be money. And I got doubts. For what exactly is all this money? To do what? For what is the money? He also explained later that the money would be for reforesting. To plant, I don't know what. Word is depleted that we have to recuperate it all. So we all sat there thinking, wondering. Who will explain this to us comprehensible and better? All of us, the leaders, we don't understand well Portuguese. So who will explain this to us? After this NGO meeting, a month later, they came back, and we had another meeting. They explain everything that each community would receive 20,000. That every aldea, they would receive this money, should organize and plan what to do with the money. And even more, I had doubts. For what is all this? Well, this is what happened with ISA that brought this to us. This is red. Who explained this to you? Andre Villas Boas. He came and brought this to us. He explained all this to us. But I still remain with my doubts. I still have concerns. For what is all this? So that's what happened. They are forcing, they are pushing us to accept this red. Up to now we don't understand this. This is what happened with ISA. And she asks, what do you remember, what did they explain to you about the carbon market and red? Okay, how did they explain? Let me think. How is that? That the burning, they explain like this, that the smoke goes into the air, don't know that it's causing a lot of heat, don't know how to explain. He even showed the, what's the name? The globe. <laughs> He showed where ice is melting, this and that, even a white bear that's endangered. <laughs> that the polar bear would have nowhere to go, no place to live, and so forth. That the ice would melt, that the project would be for that reason. 
then we should preserve our forest. But what does that mean? We have always preserved our forests. We know our forests. We have knowledge about everything here. We know our forests. So he brought this information to us from what I remember, what he explained to us. She asks, did he explain that this program you would give you would give to those that pollute a lot in exchange? Carbon credits that would authorize them to continue to pollute or pollute more? Did he explain that? No, this was not explained. I remember this. That was not explained. He did not explain anything, how it would be afterwards, what would happen, how. He did not explain anything in that regard. After the meeting, many felt excited because of the money that everyone would receive. We wondered why will the money be divided by each community. Did he say how much money everyone would get? I remember it was each community 20,000 reals, which I looked up and it wasn't that much money. Per year? I don't know if this is per year, he said. She asks, they'll come again to talk to you? He'll come back with a response to us. What was talked, he will bring that to us, a response. And she said, a response for what? He says, a response to us because he spoke to them and will bring their response. From the big people that are responsible, what they said, he'll bring their message to us. Did he explain who is responsible? He explained it's from foreign persons. He did not say who exactly, but that they are from outside Brazil. Did he explain that they will get a lot of money? He said there will be a lot of money. But did he explain if ISA would get the money, and this is the NGO who came out to them? ISA doesn't count. They do things in their name. He only informed that they will receive a lot of money that would be forwarded directly to the indigenous peoples. And he said that the problem would be that you burn too much. He said that? Yes, he said, you burn too much, way too much. <laughs> but we say that we indigenous peoples have burned like this since a long time. We always burn at a place where we fish, hunt, or to open a small farmland area. We burn small farm areas to plant. That is our indigenous way. And now the NGO wants to prohibit that. That is not acceptable. We have to live as well. We have to plant. She asked, he explained that you cannot burn anymore? Yes, he said that burning would no longer be possible, not allowed to do. That left us with the question, how would we handle this with our elders that are used to burn? We burn for fishing, hunting, to make things. I do not know why they want us to change this. But when you burn, it also grows again, she asks. Here it always grows back. Our farmland, when we open a space to farm, we plant, collect manioc. After some years, everything recuperates again. The forest grows back while we plant in another place. Years later, we go back to that place. It's always done in that way, always. And now, someone comes here and wants to prohibit everything. I think that won't work for us. She asks, did he also said that you can't cut wood? 
Yes, and other things. What I was telling you is what I remember. They said so many things, management and all that. So much was said. <laughs> <laughs> but they vacated a long time ago, Aria. They work now in middle and lower Shingu, but they don't work here no longer. But in interviews with foreign places, they say Shingu in the name of the Shingu. That's what they say in interviews, but in reality, they are no longer working in the upper Shinku. Because you asked them to leave? Because we ordered them to leave our area. That's the truth. I say it might be angry with me, they might complain and deny, but I will respond to them. You are expelled from, expelled from here, all right. You are no longer here in the upper Jingu. And that's the end. I want, this is just something new that uh, we found, but I want to show that to people because I want people to see like first hand or from someone who lives there, like what it's like, you know, <laughs> because you will be told like, oh, indigenous peoples receive profits, you know, they're part of this, da 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 da, but that's like the reality of what this is. I think it's funny when he talks about the white bear. <laughs> Yeah? There's a whole thing they present about how these indigenous people create global warming by burning. And I, my, my background is an anthropologist, and I must be good because I got to be here. <laughs> but the thing is, the amount that the area that they burn is small. It's totally for self-sufficiency. They rotate crop, which is very efficient. Mm -hmm. The burning imparts nitrogen, helps nitrogen fixation in the ground. And if you compare growing that amount of food using you know, oil-based tractors and pesticide mm -hmm. technology and everything else, I mean, their impact is so negligible. And yet I'm always right. hearing this thing about how these natives are reluctantly burning down the entire plain <laughs> It may I be know. true in some <laughs> cattle operations, but then those are all coming out of the big cities with big capital. Mm -hmm. These tribes, yeah, they're That's just That's the living. way everybody should impact the earth. And it's really an insanity to go down there and tell them to give up their way of living so somebody can get a carbon offset, which is basically bullshit license just to pollute more. <laughs> I agree with you. So, okay, so I'll try and run through the rest of this quickly so other people can have more time to talk as well. Um, so IEN, we're going to go down to Cancun with these basic four principles for climate justice, which there's much more written about each of these, but I think they're pretty self-explanatory. The first is to leave fossil fuels in the ground. And so a lot of people say to me, like, well, what if, you know, if we're not going to do these offsets or this carbon market, what are we supposed to do? And I'm like, well, what we're going to do is if we're successful as a, our indigenous communities and in stopping a lot of these things that are happening in our area, people are going to be forced to <laughs> because the source is going to be cut off the um, the tap, stop the tap. You know, I mean that's really our strategy, and I feel like um, in 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 solidarity with a lot of other communities, you know, there's this. Uh, You'll hear in Cancun other places, they say, leave the coal in the hole, the oil in the soil, and the tar sands in the land. It's, in a, total, it's a worldwide and global call to just stop uh, fossil fuels and put a moratorium on fossil fuel development as a first step. The second is to demand real and effective solutions. So that's to get away with all of these false solutions that we just talked about, and more, I'm sure, can be added to that list. Um, the third is that industrialized and developed countries take responsibility. So, I mean, I think that that's also applicable to, like, even here within the United States, like, certain, pl certain people, certain communities, certain cities use more than they really need to be using. And so that needs to be addressed on a global level and also local level. And then the last is living in a good way on Mother Earth, um, which is really kind of what it all boils down to in the end, and I'll come back to that. I wanted to quickly, I don't even know if I have any more slides. Okay, we won't go there yet. Um, kind of go through at least my understanding of the politics around climate change since I've been going since 2005, like you said, or 
Um, so everybody is like, oh, we have to, the Kyoto Protocol ends in 2012. Um, so the discussion on the international arena is what are we going to do when the Kyoto Protocol ends in 2012? That's the big question. And we have, you know, only this year and next year to figure that out. Um, last December in Copenhagen, was anybody there at the UN negotiations in Copenhagen? Besides Oren and Anne and Michael? <laughs> Um, so what happened there, uh, and I'll try and abbreviate, two weeks of negotiations, two weeks of fighting among countries on different stuff. You know, Obama comes in, the U.S. comes in on the very last day of negotiations and says, we came up with the Copenhagen Accord, we figured it out, you know, ta-da-da, la. And this was like at midnight or something um, in the negotiations room and they pass it out and they said, okay, review this in 15 minutes, we'll come back and approve it or not approve it. And as you can imagine, that caused a big shit storm, is to use, to use the actual words of the people that were in there. You know, <laughs> countries are like, you are messed up. There's a lot of fighting. Uh, the Copenhagen Accord was adopted at that, at the end, as an informational, I forget what the technical, informational document. So it's like the same as a science report. Yeah, just acknowledge, like, same as any other report. It's just in there. But from the past year, you can see that the U.S. and all these people have been you know, politicking and pushing and positioning themselves so that the Copenhagen Accord will be the basis for uh, negotiations in Cancun next month. Now, April 2010, the Cochabamba, in Cochabamba, Bolivia, the World People's Summit on Climate Change and the Rights of Mother Earth. Who is there? Yeah! <laughs> I moderated a panel that he was on, actually. <laughs> Uh, so that was a response um, by the government of Bolivia, Evo Morales, and a lot of these uh, Latin American countries that are getting much stronger and stronger, saying, you're messed up, we're going to have our own conference, it's going to be, we're going to bring grassroots people and social movements, and we're going to decide on climate policy, and that's what that was. Um, I was really impressed by that, actually, <laughs> the, the process that they went through um, to come out with the Cochabamba People's Accord and the Declaration on the Rights of Mother Earth. Um, one of the key points I'm going to pull out of there is that it, that accord is against REDS. Um, and at the time when it came out, people were like, yeah, yeah, whatever, la, 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 do you, you know, that's very nice, um, but it's not going to go anywhere. But um, as far as I know, the latest uh, texts has a lot of the parts of the Cochabamba People's Accord in it for the negotiation process. So as we go into Cancun, that's what we're going to be fighting, you know, the Copenhagen Accord and the Cochabamba People's Accord. Um, I, something else I wanted to bring up, did anybody go to the U.S. Social Forum in Detroit in June? <laughs> okay. Um, Something that I think we've witnessed, us who work in climate change and climate justice, is there has been, just within the past year, a lot more people who are getting involved in the issue of climate change, who are coming from a social justice perspective. Um, you know, last year was the first time in years, really, I'd say that uh, there was a delegation of U.S. social justice and environmental justice organizations that came um, to Copenhagen. Usually it's just been, you know, uh, the usual D.C. Beltway type of people who go to these negotiations. Um, and this year, uh, that same group, they brought maybe like 15 people last year. This year they're bringing 50. So there's a big... There's like a movement happening in the U.S. where people are much easier beginning to relate to this issue of climate change. And that's also happening, I think, on a much larger scale. I think Bolivia has a lot to do with that. Um, I went to the Social Forum of the America, Americas in Paraguay, too. And I also saw there that a lot of the social movements are also beginning to take on the issue of climate change just within the past year because they're much easier being able to attach it to immigration issues 
to um, food sovereignty issues, to uh, land use issues, like people are, it's just becoming much more real for them. And so I think that this is very important because I think Cancun is gonna be a really different place than Copenhagen was. Definitely because the UNFCCC and the Mexican government are gonna be much more strict. Um, because of a lot of the actions and things that happened last year, but also because there is a whole new base of people who are really taking on this issue just within the past year, and that's something that I am super excited about. Um, so Cancun, Mexico, November 29th to December 10th. We're going to be battling it out. Uh, Cochabamba People's Accord versus the Copenhagen Accord. I think this is about... This is a, a battle between uh, ways of thinking and way of life, basically. So are we going to continue this whole path of commodification, of air, of traditional knowledge, of biodiversity? And just got back from the uh, CBD Convention on Biological Diversity. Well, now they're trying to offset, uh, create biodiversity offsets. So it's like, OK, we'll kill this whole ecosystem over here, but if we save this one over here, then that's OK. They're doing that with indigenous people's traditional knowledge. So they're to this is totally setting us on a path of just putting a dollar sign to everything, everything, everything. So I, I mean, when, I, when we're talking about this debate between Cochabamba and Copenhagen, to me, it's like that much more larger battle that we're having between good and evil. No, <laughs> between <laughs> David and Goliath, but about, you know, like how Evil Morales says it's a difference between the mentality of living better than this person next to you or the mentality of living well, everybody's ability to live well. Um, so lastly, strategies for moving forward. Um, these are just very basic. You know, I, first of all, I'm going to say that it really annoys me when people are like, well, what should we do then? And I think that <laughs> I'm like, I, sh I don't know what you're going to do in New York City. You know, like, I come from the Navajo Reservation. This is what I'm doing here. And so I feel like we can go to the UN and we can go to these big international meetings to set guidelines and principles, but we can't expect that there's going to be one overarching or one silver bullet solution to this giant problem. And when we go into Cancun and these places, we really go over the mentality that we're going to stop REDS, we're going to stop the commodification of air, and we're going to stop this p direction. Um, but the solutions to things, they happen on the local Local level. And that starts also with environmental justice groups, grassroots groups, and frontline communities who are shutting down Peabody Coal Company, who are shutting down and regulating on the Richmond Refinery in Oakland, who are um, shutting down or keeping from happening all of these coal fired power plants, all of this offshore drilling, all of this incinerators, you know. That, that's what climate, that's what stopping climate change looks like to me. So that's one. The second thing is building local resiliency. So this is about our communities, me on my, you know, <coughs> res, you here, you know, in Vermont, figuring out how we're able to take care of ourselves and not be dependent on fruit from anywhere in the world any day that you want it, you know, and not to be dependent on um, compact fluorescent light bulbs that are built in China in really bad working conditions and really polluting industries. You know, like, we need to move beyond that and build the re resiliency of our local communities, but also even regions. Um, and then the third is, I told you, there's this whole base of movement happening. We need to do a lot of work to solidify and build that base, that climate justice movement, which is coming with a different framework that's based on human rights and the ability of every single person on the planet to live a good life. And then lastly, I think, and not most importantly, but very important, is to challenge and change the frame of the discussion. So to take it away from 300 parts per million and move it to like what the real discussion is, what we're really talking about, you know. And another thing that people say to us is, that's politically unrealistic. And I'm like, no, it's unrealistic that we're going to keep allowing you to totally kill us, is that's what's unrealistic to me. You know <laughs> what I mean? And so then a lot of these, thank you. 
a lot of these, you know, uh, big enviros and big greens, you know, they start at a place where they're catering to the governments catering to the corporations and the brokers who don't want anything to change. They want business as usual. And of course, if that's where you start, you're not going to get anywhere. That's why climate policy in this country has not happened, is not supported, because we're over here saying, oh, you know, giant multinational corporation who makes billions and trillions of dollars off of doing what you do. Will you stop it just this little bit? You know, that's not going to work. So I think we have a lot of work to do in terms of base building to push to the direction of what's politically realistic in the country. And the last thing, uh, do I keep saying the last thing? Yeah. Now it really is the last thing, sorry, um, that I wanted to leave you with. OK, there's my information. But December 7th is a international call to action. It's going to be during the UN negotiations. I think it's being led by La Via Campesina, which is an international awesome grassroots movement um, of indigenous peoples and campesinos who are calling for many Cancuns on December 7th. So this is like, if you're not able to be in Cancun here, you're going to be able to do something, you know. And so we have committed um, within our network to organizing major events in I keep. I think the number keeps getting bigger. I keep making it bigger, but I think it's like ten cities in the U.S. So I would leave that December seventh with you um, as something that you can do uh, to help support the work that we're doing in Cancun. So thank you very much. I'm going to end there. I hope that you guys are not depressed. I hope you're <laughs> excited. You know, when we talk about the prospect of figuring out how everyone can live well, you know getting rid of capitalism and moving towards, you know, I have it written here, question mark, question mark, question mark. I think those question marks are what's really exciting um, for us to figure out. So thank you very much. So I'll moderate the question and answers, if that's OK. And uh, um, let's see, I have two hands, so starting there and then there. I sort of have a, a two questions. One is, um, how would you sort of suggest engaging some of the like, mainline green groups like 350? Um, one thing about them is that I, I was pretty impressed with how some of those groups seem to, at least in word, take up um, the same kind of call of, of like, indigenous communities that at COP15, um, they pretty much said, like, yeah, the first world has a climate debt, da 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 da. But sort of from your perspective, like, how, um, I'll say a little bit more about what's wrong with that kind of very scientific, kind of weirdly apolitical, like, 350 PPM kind of thing. Um, and maybe I just want to ask my other question, actually, before we can talk. Um, well, I think what's wrong with that, with just saying 350 PPM, is that we could reach, well, theoretically, we could reach 350 ppm by using nuclear energy or by using clean coal technology or carbon sequestration, you know? And it leaves a lot of open room for false solutions, and, and that's my main problem with it. It's also the number of where it begins to affect the north and the white countries. That's right. That's, yeah, that's also, I, I don't know what the exact number is, maybe. You guys know, but I know that the target that um, they've set, definitely in the Copen uh, uh, Copenhagen Accord, is well beyond what is needed to keep the island nations from going underwater. Um, just two quick comments and then a question. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Helen Scott. I'm on the lecture series board. And I'm really proud to be on board and uh, listening to you today. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and I also wanted to say that you know you, you started with that the statistic and saying well indigenous people are such a small percentage of the population and, and therefore it's such a small issue. And I just wanted to say I mean I, you know I know that you know this, but it's really the issues you're talking about are the issues of humanity. Um, and if we don't start paying attention to them, then we are all do. Um, the second thing I wanted to say is an announcement. Will Miller famously taught a class on Marxism here that changed the lives of many students. Um, we haven't managed to replicate the course, but we are having a conference here this Saturday. So those of you who are interested, I've got a flyer over here, just let me know. 
how you're all invited. Um, and then my question is also kind of about UVM. Um, one of the big arguments here that you didn't address is one of the false solutions, and that is green consumerism. And what a lot of people say here is when you say, you know, you should be an activist, you should get involved, they say, oh, I buy green products. And the UVM is always saying, well, we build green buildings. And I wanted you to just come back as you've done so well to those other false solutions to that. To that. Yes, you're right. I only had an hour, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, I, I totally agree. I mean, uh, yeah, sometimes I'll ask people, like, how many of you, like, at, you know, the Bioneers Conference or some big, you know, conference where people fly in from all over the place and talk about green, being green? And I'll say, how many of you paid extra $30 or whatever to offset your plane ticket? I did, and they're so proud. But I'm like, what did your money actually go to? Well, I don't know. Well, <laughs> and then I say, you know, uh, give them examples of these different projects, like the REDS projects that these things will go to. And, you know, I think, yeah, I usually had this little rant about, I started off by saying, you know, CFL light bulbs that are created in, made in China, you know, Priuses that are made in China with child labor, you know, and really polluting industry, you know, that that's not green, you know. Um, I, I don't know. I disagree with you. And, and, and I, I totally agree that I think, again, that's part of that frame that people just believe that they can buy their way out of everything. Um, when buying things is what the problem is in the first place. And, you know, it's like, oh, well, I have a, a navigator, but I have a Prius, too. And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. But... Yeah, I agree. We can't buy our way out of the problem. Okay, uh, in the back, and then you. We have an interesting uh, dilemma here with electricity in the state. Um, we have an aging nuclear power plant. And um, recently, last year, the, the Vermont um, uh, state legislator proved to um, reclassify hydroelectric energy as, as green energy. Mm -hmm. So we can classify it. I'm wondering, so we're going to be getting a lot more energy from hydroelectric. You know, new um, utilities have signed contracts for us. Now, I'm curious if you can shed any light on, on what that means and what, what's the story and what's going on with hydroelectric like you're familiar with that and the impact of the indigenous lands. Yeah, I don't know much about it, but my coworker Clayton could answer that totally because that's where his, he's from. Um, and that, I mean, that even happened in communities here, you know, several communities here in California and in North Dakota um, who have been kicked off and removed from areas that they've lived so that they can create, you know, these big hydro projects and dams. And so, you know, I, I usually I would say, because we have a lot of communities who are against uh, hydropower. Um, They're leaching incredible amounts of money. And that's right. And they actually cause a lot of uh, emissions of carbon dioxide because of the stagnation of all that forest and stuff. Um, so, I mean, I think really what it gets down to is anything can be. Solar panels, wind farms, they can all be destructive and they can all be negative. And I think that it really comes down to the scale of things, you know. Um, so, I mean, that's the best answer that I can give you now. But if you guys want to bring a speaker out here to talk about the impacts of Hydro-Quebec, I'm sure we could find several for you. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, you talked about not commodifying things like energy um, the carbon market, but what about doing it sort of on more of a local level? Because you said that you can't tell people in New York City what to do. Maybe creating like, how do you feel about creating like caps on car on carbon or on fossil fuel use, and then sort of like tiering pricing? Like you know, the first first units are very um, people need them the most, so they're cheaper and then if you if you need to use more, if you feel like you need to use more without obviously exceeding the limit on fossil fuel use, you can maybe trade like carbon coupons. They had they had coupons for heating in like the in World War II, uh, but people weren't allowed to trade them. But if you could trade them more on lo a local level, like in the city of Burlington, how would you, so that maybe poorer people would value the money more than fossil fuel use. 
Like, do you think that you should, because I feel that there aren't many solutions to, unless telling people to just stop using fossil fuels so much, but people aren't really necessarily going to listen because people say that all the time. Then you, like, what would your proposed policy be? You're asking me that question, and I told you not to ask me. Well, <laughs> what, you're actually, what are you going to, to this conference? Uh, I mean, you're like arguing against reds, and um, I'm just actually like curious because I don't know like, mm -hmm. what, what you're proposing as an alternative. Like, well, like I said, I'm not going to these international negotiations proposing another giant global policy because I don't think that that would work, no matter what it is. Um, and so I think we go to that larger area to really stop things, at least for me and the communities that we work with. Um, but in terms of solutions-oriented things, yeah, that must happen on a much more smaller and regional level. And you know, your question of, well, what if we priced carbon on in Burlington and carbon coupons, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, Going back to, like I said, you know, in giant or giant in big cities like this, I don't know. I think part of it comes. The first step is doing an audit of where your energy comes from, and I think no matter what, we are going to support the communities who are trying to stop, you know, fossil fuel development. Some of which might be coming here. I don't know. Maybe natural gas is a big issue over here now. I know that we work with a lot of communities who are. Um, opposing the fracking stuff that's happening in New York State around natural gas or liquefied natural gas ports in Maine. Uh, we've worked with the Passamaquoddy as well. So, I mean, I don't know. Again, I think we're in that weird time of experimentation. Um, and I think, you know, when we were in uh, Cochabamba and in Paraguay, I think a lot of the Latin American countries are leading a lot of those experiments. Um, even Bolivia, who actually had like the largest REDS project <laughs> in the world to offset BP in Bolivia. Um, so given the situation that we're in, how do we transition away from that um, is a good question. You know, I think that there needs to be a real effort in doing regional scale just transition plans and planning, which I don't even think anybody has done. Yeah, that's <laughs> the solution I was saying, like region by region, just in localities, people, because yeah, I guess it is different everywhere. We use a lot more fossil fuels here than we do in Navajo Nation. Mm -hmm. Well, we use a lot, we, or you know, we produce a lot, but we don't use a lot. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I don't know, I mean, I, I don't know exactly, and, and I have no idea if I don't have you know, the pros and cons of whatever the specific thing that you just proposed. But I would think that a first step would be the creation of a just transition plan for Burlington, Vermont, or something like that, you know? I mean, as a first step to figure out that process. I don't know, it's the best answer I could give. I have uh, one, and then two a gray shirt, and then right in front of you, and then Paul. Is this one? Yeah. Oh, uh, this is <laughs> I'd like to hear just a little bit more detail. You mentioned you know, about the changes in the last year of seeing much, so much more grassroots support for the negotiations going on. If you could, um, in a perfect world, what would you like to see there? What, you know, what is the impact there? And, and what would you really like to see that would make a significant difference for the In, in Cancun? Yeah, so, and not just Cancun, but beyond Cancun. Hmm. What do you, what's your, your big dream? My big dream. Why? I want a giant house and five cars, say. Hey. No. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, well, I think one of the main things I would love to see coming out of Cancun specifically is that Reds is totally stopped. Even bigger than that. Well, one of the things that I want is, um, I don't, you know, at least for me where I'm at, I want uh, the I want this connection to break between economic development and the destruction of our culture and way of life because these two things go hand in hand right now, you know, 
And when you talk, like when I said Black Mesa, the female mountain, digging out her liver, traditionally that's something that we, of course, wouldn't do, right? But economic development, you need to make money, you need to develop, da 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 da, da pushes us to go against what our own traditional teachings is. And so for me, I want to separate those two things. And on our Navajo reservation, um, through the work of Black Mesa Water Coalition again, and then other organizations who are part of this Green Economy Coalition, we got our Navajo Nation to pass a, a Navajo Green Jobs legislation in last July. And so now, and that took convincing, okay? It was like 100, uh, we have 110 chapters on our reservation, so that means we had to visit all 110 chapter meetings, get them to sign resolutions, to go to the tribal government, to convince them to do a march, to do lobbying and organizing um, in our tribal government, where we have 88 delegates that represent those 110 chapters, um, to pass the green jobs legislation. And so now we have created a fund for green jobs on the reservation, and we've created um, a green economy commission who's now intake, they just had their first meeting last week. And so now they're intaking proposals of pilot projects for green development on our reservation that would be uh, traditionally, um, traditionally, not sensitive, because that sounds lame, but <laughs> traditionally and culturally appropriate. Um, and so we have some of those things, but for me that's the most important thing because a lot of, you know what, a lot, a lot of old Navajo elders and grandmas who are living there, chopping wood, people have to haul wood for them, I don't want to tell them, well, you can't have electricity. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think that that's right either, or, but I feel like that there is a balance of how things that could happen and that we could definitely develop um, in a way that's self-sustaining. So. I mean, I think there's a lot more that I could say about how I want our people to be, you know, how I want our like uh, our practices to be revitalized and all those kind of things. But I think to around this topic, that's the main point is that we need to break away from you can break the tie between economic development and um, cultural destruction for our people. <coughs> And I'm going to suggest that we take the next three questions in succession, and then you can answer them all uh, in the interest of time, because we're starting to run out of time. And uh, I would also be great if there are people here who are interested in organizing around December 7th, um, one of the thousand Cancuns that Via Capucina has called for, that you stick around afterward and meet each other and uh, talk about <laughs> that. So um, the next three questions, you pass? OK. Um, did you still have a question? Okay. Yeah. Oh, um well, my question, you did sort of just address it, but I just, um, I guess since I have more, I just wanted to make a really quick um, plug for an event that some other UVM students and I are organizing on um, November 15th, um, sort of in, um, in response to this fantasy of green consumerism that was also addressed here. <coughs> um, we're planning a Buy Nothing Day on the UVM campus. <laughs> And um, it's going to be a community event, so anyone in and around Burlington um, is encouraged to show up. And basically, we're trying to organize um, a, a one-day alternative to all consumerism for students <laughs> and community members um, in order to educate people about more mindful consumerism and um, spending their money when they have to in more conscious and um, local community um, outlets. And so if anyone um, wants more information, they should ask me or email me about participating. And also, if you just want to show up in the day and bring a dish to share, because we're going to have a community potluck, or if you have um, a skill that you'd like to share, or like want to set up a workshop, we're um, going to have spaces for that. So I just. This is a community event, so I thought it'd be a good piece to announce that. Cool. Well, I'll try hey, to I have another big question for you to finish on. I can understand not putting any hopes in international agreements now, given who's at the table, basically mm -hmm. the representatives of the nation states and their corporations and their energy in industry who are not going to agree to anything that's going to harm your national interest. Right. And I saw in, in Copenhagen on Democracy Now! which had great coverage that indigenous activists were very um, 
correct about assessing this problem, and they were simply excluded from the conference. But at the same time, capitalism is a global system that there's almost mm -hmm. no more global ecological challenge than climate change because nothing is isolated and economies are interconnected over the whole globe. It seems like local initiatives are just not up to that kind of challenge when you have mm -hmm. countries competing against each other, like the United States and Asia, et cetera. So I, mean, I can understand not having faith in this process, but it seems like we need some sort of global agreement that we can actually enforce to rein this in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think, well, I think some things that we can do on an international level are the specifics of emission reduction target commitments or, you know, the um, commitment to uh, provide funding to developing countries, you know, kind of general principles like that. But the very, but, but, I mean, so I agree with you, um, but it's also kind of like chicken and the egg type of thing too, the way that I'm thinking about it is, there's not sufficient local action that you said. I feel like that's something that we really need to build, you know, and I don't think, or and, and maybe this is just my biased opinion, but I don't think that <clears throat> that's something that there has been a significant effort to build in the U.S. and Canada. Um, so, again, you know, we participate in the local, the regional, the national, and the international because each arena has its pros and cons. But I, 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 I still don't look to the U.N. framework to solve this problem for us um, and definitely not to the current governments to solve this problem for us. I don't think it makes any sense to rely on them for that. This is the taken over. This is the taken over everything. Yeah, he said the business has taken over everything. Yeah. So, I don't know. Uh, one last. Oh, I just... I have a question specifically for you about the Navajo Nation. Um, would you say that if you, um, like, you know, so you sort of have this blank check on policy and your funding, and you could pick out all of the non-Navajo business owners and have Navajo school systems that involve full language immersion and mm -hmm. had energy generation, like renewables, within the Navajo Nation for Navajo people specifically, and water use uh, like <laughs> protection and rights for all Navajos, and then had a clear agreement with the U.S. government that said that we do not want you to come here and develop. Do you mm -hmm. think that would be an effective, um, or like, a, would, would that be a good thing for the Navajo Nation? Like, uh, I think so. <laughs> um, it's f yes. Um, Yes, I think that would be a good thing. And I would think that that would be a good thing for any community and not just the Navajo Nation, is ability to take care of themselves. Um, but that does take a lot of work. Like even, you know, there's been, a, a lot of people have been having this uh, resilience, this, uh, I think it's a, a, probably becoming a much more common word now, um, resilience. And so on the one hand, I'd say us Navajo people are totally resilient because, you know, for the fact that a lot of us haven't lived without electricity or running water, you know, we are able to some extent to really take care of ourselves more than other people. At the same time, there is all of these outside forces that through very um, blatant and sneaky ways uh, take away our ability to do that. Like a big debate that's happening on the Navajo Nation now is whether or not to sign on to the North, Northern Arizona Water Settlement Agreement. And that's like, <clears throat> I mean, this is just something in the past month that has come up that we've been doing a lot of education around. And the truth is, is like a very tough question, you know, because we've had our lawyers who are bringing this, this water settlement agreement that's like for the lower Colorado River system, um, that's like 31,000 acre feet of water 
that they that they want to allocate to us. The Navajo Generating Station um, in Page, which takes coal from uh, our reservation and uses it to pump water down to Flagstaff and Phoenix through the Central Arizona Project and Tucson, because there is no water out there, runs on 25000 a year, just that one power plant. And they want to give us 31000 as a Navajo Nation. And our lawyers will tell, like, are telling us that that is the best deal that we're going to get. They've been negotiating it since 1985. Um, you know, if you go into litigation, you're going to get pushed into the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court is not going to rule in favor of you. You know, and so it's like we're always stuck in between this rock and hard place, like knowing that any decision we make is not sufficient enough. So, I don't even know how I got off on this this tangent, but uh, <laughs> I guess to just to bring up the point that if we could do that, I think that's what we're striving for, is our ability to be able to take care of ourselves, you know, and to maintain like our own tradition and culture, which, you know, you can get into the whole process of how that has become degraded as well over the past 50 years in particular, past 500 years, you know. Um, so I guess to answer your question, yes, I think that that is something good that I'd want to see. Um, but again, I think that's just a long process and for us to figure out too, you know, because like I said, the Desert Rock Energy Project was a Navajo Nation tribal government uh, project that the community people didn't agree with and stopped. It's pretty much dead now, you know? So it's, um, I don't know, we'll see. I think it's been a long time since um, any of us have been in any kind of position to be able to really take care of ourselves in that truly like resilient and self-sufficient regional way. But I don't know. I feel like that is kind of what we're moving towards. Thank you. Thank you.